The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... is a guardian angel? The dictionary says it's an angel supposed to have a special care for a particular individual. Who would not wish to have such a concerned, protective spirit guiding each tentative step, tempering each rash thought, restraining every imprudent action? But is there such a spirit, such an angel? Or is the whole concept only a fantasy born of need and desire? Well, that is what our story is all about. Where have you been? Oh, all over, Mother. I don't want you traipsing around by yourself. I wasn't by myself. Oh? Who was with you? Oh, Mother. You know. My guardian angel. mystery drama Guardian Angel was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars John Beale and Jada Rowland. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and Buick Motor Division. I'll be back shortly with Act One. from the moment you are born. First, you struggle to breathe. Then, to turn over. Next, you fight to stand up. After that, to walk. I haven't time to list all the battles that must inevitably follow, but you can go down to defeat waging any one of them. And that is why you yearn all your life for a guardian angel. My son David and I have lived in this big house ever since the accident that killed my wife, uh, his mother, and crippled me for good. We stayed on here because, well, because it's a beautiful place, we were used to it, uh, and because there didn't seem to be much point in moving. Every morning, David went to the factory and ran the business. Every evening, he came home and we discussed the business over a glass of sherry. At dinner... We talked about current events. After dinner, we had an hour or two of chess, which has the virtue of requiring a bare minimum of conversation. Then we speculated on what the weather might be on the morrow. Then we went to bed. Now, that's the way it had been for three years. Till that evening in June. David? Yes, Father? Uh, Sherry's ready and waiting. Well, I'll be right there. We're uh, out of water biscuits, I'm afraid. Uh, that's all right. Uh, cook forgot to put them on her list. Uh, will you pour? Oh, uh, glad to. Uh, there are things at the plant. Uh, as usual. You done anything about the body paint they've been sending us? Mm, I've made some inquiries. Oh, uh, here's your sherry. Uh, thank you. You like this sherry? Um, yes, yes, very good. Uh, why don't you taste it uh, before you say it's fine? Well, haven't I? Oh, I, I thought I, um... Father, I met a girl this morning. You met a girl? Uh, where did you meet her? On our lawn, sitting under that very old apple tree. Uh, she, uh, live around here, this girl? Uh, no, she lives over on the south side. Yeah, the other side of the tracks. What's her name? Jane. That's what she's called, Jane. Well, if that's what she's called, then that's her name. Well, it's not her real name, she says. Well, what is her real name? She doesn't know. She says that's what she's trying to find out. You could have knocked me over with a feather. There I am sitting on the front porch, and this car pulls up at the curb. Biggest car I ever saw, about a mile long. A man in a uniform gets out of the front of it and opens the door to the back, lifts down this 
slanty board like a ramp, sort of. And outside, this gentleman in a wheelchair. Uh, I beg your pardon. Uh, could I trouble you? Me? You want something? Uh, just to inquire, is there a girl living here by the name of Jane? You mean my daughter, Jane? What do you want with her? Nothing, really, except to meet her. If she's the right one, uh, is she at home? Oh, no, she's off somewhere. She won't tell me where she's going. She just takes off and goes to the library, reads and strolls down to the lake and takes a swim and wanders over to the other side of the tracks and looks at the big houses. Mm, sounds like the girl I'm looking for. Uh, is your daughter's name really Jane? Well, I just told you it is. Uh, but uh, does she have another name? Oh, no, her name's Jane. Named after me, Jane. Well, is she, uh, forgive my asking, but by any chance, is she adopted? Adopted? My daughter adopted? She said Jane was only what she was called, that her real name was something different. Oh, no, not that again. She's not starting up with that again. You mean this is some sort of uh, an obsession with her? Obsession? Yeah, yeah. It's an obsession. She's obsessed. Since she was this high, she's been saying Jane isn't her real name. Well, she told my son she was looking for her real name. <laughs> That's what she's been saying since she first knew what her name is. Denied it right off. I tried to beat it into her. Your name is Jane, I kept telling her. It's Jane. I gave it to myself. But she'd pull herself up tall and look at me like I was a dummy. And she'd say, That's the name you gave me. But it's not my real name, and someday I'm going to find out what my real name is, and you can't stop me. I tell you, sometimes I wanted to... Uh Uh-oh, here she comes. Finally decided to drag herself home. Uh, Excuse me. Jane? Jane! Yes, Mother? Where have you been? Oh, all over. I don't want you tracing around by yourself. I wasn't by myself. Oh? Who was with you? Oh, Mother... You know, my guardian angel. She wasn't beneath the ancient apple tree every morning when I went for work, but when she was, I'd stop for a few minutes and talk to her. At first, just for a minute or two about the weather, perfectly ordinary conversation, except that whenever she said it was going to rain, it did rain, and at exactly the hour she said it would. And when she said it would turn chilly in the afternoon, it did turn chilly. And in the afternoon. After a while, I let myself be a little late getting to the office so that I could spend more time with her beneath the twisted old apple tree. One morning, I was shocked to find her sitting there holding a snake in her hands, holding it to her ear. Jane! Jane, what on earth? Uh, Put that thing down! Mom! Be quiet, baby. Look, uh, give it to me. Hush. Please, hush. Th- th- that's a snake you've got there, for heaven's sake. Don't talk. Don't disturb her. Well, what do you think you're doing with that thing? Listening. L- listening to, to what? To the snake? Of course. The uh, snake is talking to you? What's he talking about? About love. Oh, Jane. Sometimes I... Look, look, would you put the snake down, will you? All right. He stopped anyway. When you made so much noise. You're a crazy little girl, you know that? You think so? Hmm. Listening to snakes who speak of love. Yesterday you told me you saw a fairy's funeral. I did. Mm-hmm. The uh, fairy's body laid out on a rose leaf carried by grayish green grasshoppers. They looked like grasshoppers. Now, Jane, did you really see anything like that? I think I did. I may have. But you're not sure. Maybe it was William Blake who saw it, and I just read about it. William Blake was a poet. Oh, yes. He was a mystic and visionary. Oh, yes, he had visions. Would you like to hear a poem of his? It isn't very long, and I love it. Well, if you love it, I'd I'd like to hear it. All right. I traveled through a land of men. A land of men and women, too. And heard and saw... Such dreadful things as cold earth wanderers never knew. That's, um, 
Mm, very nice. You don't have to like it. Poetry isn't written for cold earth wanderers. Is that what you think I am? I'm afraid you are. Well, then why do you come here so often? Why do you bother to talk to me at all, if that's what you think? I thought at first you might be my other eye. What's that? My... my other eye? Your other you? Well, what's that? Don't you know anything? That's a friend. Like 220 and 284. Those are friendly numbers. 220 can be divided by 1, 2, 4, 5, 10, 11, 20, 44, 55, and 110. And those numbers add up to 284, which can be divided by 1, 2, 4, 71, and 142. And those numbers add up to 220. Uh Mm-hmm. Did you figure that out by yourself? Of course not. Pythagoras did. And he called 220 and 284 friendly numbers. See? Mm Mm-hmm. So, I thought if you were 220 and I was 284, you were my other I. And I was your other you. And we would be friends. See? Well, I, I, I don't see it all. You're, you're 16 years old. You, you haven't even finished high school. How do you know all these things? Well, lots of it is in books. And other things I think up for myself. Look, I have to go now. Uh, oh, don't go yet. Where do you have to go? To Dr. Alden's sanitarium. I like to talk to Dr. Alden. He's nice. Not a cold earth wanderer like me? Oh, not at all. And I like to talk to the mad people, too. Will I see you tomorrow here? Maybe. Probably. Possibly. Please. I've given you a headache, haven't I? I know I have. Oh. Don't worry. It'll go away by ten o'clock. Now I've got to go see Dr. Alden. Actually, we have very few psychotic patients at the sanitarium. Mostly, we house and treat some very confused and unhappy people who have suffered a failure of nerve and can no longer deal with their lives and their feelings about themselves. I always look forward to Jane's visits. Together, we spoke of the intangibles, things most people shy away from, Probably out of a fear of being misunderstood. I don't know. I can't tell. Possibly because of a sense that they have forgotten or mislaid their feelings about such things as love and loss and grief. But Jane and I spoke freely of these things and many others. And I always felt better afterwards. Then she'd wander off and talk to the disturbed patients and afterwards they seem to feel better too. Surely you had to learn the Pythagorean theorem in school. But what else do you know about the famous Greek philosopher? Do you know that he believed in reincarnation and stated firmly that he remembered his own previous existences? I thought you might like to know these gossipy little items about a very great celebrity who lived 2,500 years ago. Who has not been impressed, amused, shocked, or delighted by the imaginings of children? And who has not at times placed the heavy hand of disapproval upon them and called them lies? And so the pleasure of their imaginings deserted the children and left them what today we like to think of as realistic. Satisfied that we have improved their characters and their chances for success in our world, we fail to notice that they have also become 
slightly dull and apathetic. I've never been so embarrassed in my entire life. Here was this man. You could tell right away he was a gentleman. Even if he was in a wheelchair, the big car, the chauffeur, and the way he talked, so polite, so polished. I knew right away he came from the north side of the tracks. And my daughter, my only child, who I'd scraped and saved and gone about for, my Jane had picked up this gentleman's son, Lord knows where, and told him her name wasn't really Jane. It was something else. And as if that wasn't bad enough, right in the middle of my conversation with the gentleman... She comes sashaying up the street and says she's been gallivanting around town with, guess who? Her guardian angel. Can you believe it? Now, Jane, suppose you tell me what you've been up to. And don't look at me like you don't know what I'm talking about. That gentleman you saw me talking to when you finally condescended to come home, he was here to ask me if you were adopted. Adopted. Now, where would he get an idea like that? I don't know, Mother. I'll tell you where. From you. I don't even know the gentleman. Aha, uh-huh, but you know his son. Do I? You know you do. You told his son your name isn't Jane. Oh, you mean David. And you dragged up that old notion of yours and told you this, this David. And he told it to his father. And by now it's probably all over town that you're not my real child. I never told anybody I wasn't your real child. And then to top everything off, you tell me right in front of the gentleman that you've been out on a date with your guardian angel. Oh, Mother, what will he think of you? It doesn't matter. Well, it matters to me. Bad enough people should think you're not my own child. And now they'll start to think you're a loony. How would you like that? I wouldn't mind. Maybe you'd like to go and live with the other loonies in Dr. Alden's sanitarium. I was there today. Again? What do you do there? You never tell me what you do there. Oh, I just talk to people and they talk to me and talk about what? Anything. Everything. Do you know there are people there who spent time with Moses and with Dante and with Jesus? It's very interesting. That settles it. Well, where are you going? Just sit right where you are. You find out. I'm not going to sit with my hands folded while you make a fool out of me. Dr. Alden speaking? Oh, Dr. Alden. This is Jane's mother. Oh, yes. I want to see you, Dr. Alden, in person. About having my daughter committed. tell you I was pretty shaken up when I left the house of the girl named Jane. Uh, the girl who said her name wasn't Jane. I hadn't been very favorably impressed by the mother of the girl. A crude sort of woman, too self-assertive for my taste. Still, she seemed very, uh, very down to earth. Very sensible, a rational sort. And the girl Jane, a pretty little thing with a sort of pale, underwater look, But her calm, flat statement that she'd spent the day in the company of her guardian angel, well, it's just not the sort of remark one expects to hear. Not at all. Yes, I was badly shaken up by the whole thing. And when David came home that night, I'd already had a sherry or two without waiting for him. David? Uh, Yes, Father? Sherry's ready and waiting. Be right there. There's... Water biscuits and some good Canadian cheddar cheese. Mm, good, I like that Canadian cheddar. Uh, will you pour? Happy to. A uh, half of that for me. Oh? Mm, something wrong? And I started ahead of you. Here you are. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, I want to tell you why I found it necessary to indulge myself before your arrival. Mm, it surprises me a little. I went to the girl's house this afternoon, the girl Jane, which turns out to be her correct name, even though she chooses to deny it. Then she came up the walk, and when her mother asked where she'd been, she said, with her guardian angel. Well, what do you have to say to that? 
Hmm, David? Nothing. You think the girl makes sense? I don't know. You see her every day? Well, almost. She waits for me under the old apple tree and we talk for a while. Yeah. She makes sense to you? Not always. As for instance? Well, uh, this morning she said she'd seen a deer. Well, there's no deer around here. They've all been hunted out. She said she recognized the deer. She said it was a friend of hers from her previous life. See? The girl, well, I, I won't say she's crazy, but she's, she's weird. There's something not right there. The thing is, though, Father, that when I left her to go to work, I found four hoof prints on the lawn. Impossible. But I saw them. The absurd, ridiculous. Fa- Father, look behind you. At the window. Why? What do you... Good Lord. It can't be. But it is. It's a little red deer watching us through the window. Well, I couldn't believe it. I couldn't afford to believe it. Yet I had seen, imagined I'd seen, a small red deer gazing sweetly through the window of my own drawing room. Well, I was unhinged. I'd been bewitched. I was losing my mind. It was intolerable. Intolerable. Dr. Alden speaking? Uh, Dr. Alden, I... I have to see you. I have to talk to you. I have something... Please, please. You you don't know me, but I should tell you I'm a respected citizen in this town, and I am very upset. Yes, just try to tell me what's bothering you. Well, things are going on. Strange things. I have to talk to you about them. There's a girl. She... Well, I, I don't know what to think. You want to tell me about this girl? Is that it? Well, I've never met her. Her name is Jane. My son, David, he... Now, listen. Listen for a moment. Why don't you come see me at the sanitarium? I'm always here. A thousand random thoughts went careening through my head the next morning as I approached the old apple tree. A thousand feelings I'd never known before possessed my body, my soul, made me walk unsteadily, made my eyes dim with something like tears, made me shake with something like dread, made me tingle with something like, yes, something like love. Good morning, David. I was afraid you might not be here. But I am here. And I hoped you wouldn't be. Oh? I think your father's been talking to you about me. Jane, I think I love you. Oh. But I have to say it. I'm afraid of you. Oh? I can't figure it out. You're, you're so different from anyone I've ever known. I, I'm attracted to you. I, I was attracted to you from the beginning, I think. Oh? But was I really attracted to you, or, or did you draw me to you? Which? Did the did the attraction start with me, or did you start it? Which? Did the Earth capture the moon? Or did the moon attach itself to the Earth? Which? Did the Earth capture the moon, or did the moon attach itself to the Earth? But does that mean that you are the Earth and I am the moon? Is, is that how it is? Or you are the Earth and I am the moon. That could be how it is, too. And whichever way it is, we are bound to each other. We... We love each other. Is that it? Wait. Hush. Wait. Wait. Wait for what? A sign. Wait for a sign. Uh, What happened? What, What was that? Look. The apple tree. It split. It split right down the center. It's a sign. Come in, please. You're Dr. Alden? Yes. Please, sit down. You're here about Jane, huh? I, uh, talked to you on the phone. Yes, I remember. I, um, I want that girl committed, Dr. Alden. Why? Well, I know you know her. She comes to see you from time to time. I know that. Well, you're quite right. 
she does visit me once in a while. Well, then, you know. Know what? How she is. Telling everybody her name isn't Jane. Well, what she says is that she's looking for her real name. Well, same thing. Mm, not quite. And, and talking about her guardian angel? I suppose she's told you about what she calls her guardian angel. Oh, yes. Well? Is that all? No, it's not all. It's got worse since I talked to you on the phone. Now she sees animals that aren't there. Oh, any particular animal? A red deer. She says the deer was a friend of hers in some other life. I see. There are no symptoms that I'm aware of indicating that your daughter needs to be confined in a sanitarium. I want her confined. And I'm her mother. Nevertheless, I will not accept her here. You've got to. She's a minor. Unless she wants it. If she does, then I will find a room for her. But only with the strict understanding that she may leave whenever she likes. And return when she likes as well. Now you go home and tell her that. And if she really wishes to be admitted here, I shall welcome her most cordially. We all imagine things. What could be, what might have been, what could have been, what really is. But the mystic poet William Blake once wrote, he who does not imagine in stronger and better lineaments and in a stronger and better light than his perishing mortal eye can see does not imagine at all. I shall return with Act Three shortly. Before we try to stifle the gift of fantasizing in our children and replace it with contemplation of the world known as real, consider what we are attacking. From the life of fantasy comes all the great works of art down through the ages. They have all revealed portions of the inner lives of their creators, which can then make contact with our own. We may be attempting to kill our children's ability to create, or, at the very least, their ability to respond to the creators. The following week, Jane appeared at the sanitarium with her mother, and we signed her in. Rather, she signed herself in with the accompanying stipulation that at any time at all, she was free to sign herself out. We gave her a pleasant room, and we run of the place. No regular therapy was prescribed for her, though she and I shared more frequent, earnest, and open talks than we had before. I had almost forgotten the call from the agitated man who had phoned about Jane until one day I opened the door to a distinguished looking man in a wheelchair. Uh, Dr. Alden? Yes. Oh, come in. Can I help you? I called you a while back, Doctor, uh, about that girl, Jane. Oh, oh yes. Uh, uh, my son tells me she's been committed to him. Is that what he said? Uh, not that I'm objecting, mind you. Probably the only thing to do, everything considered. Is it true? Jane is staying with us, yes. Well, that should be a big relief to me, I suppose. But it isn't, huh? David's my only child, Dr. Alden. His mother was killed in a car crash three years ago. Oh. He and I have lived together in the... <laughs> since. Uh, we've led a simple life. He took over the business, manufacturing truck bodies, good ones, though he was just barely out of college. Uh, we did all right. Our life was circumscribed, of course. Mine by this wheelchair, David's by, well, you know. No, I don't know. Look. No, I don't. I don't know at all. I think you and David have circumscribed your own lives, perhaps intentionally. Oh, no. Well, it's a traumatic thing to lose a wife, to lose a mother. Yes, but these things do happen to everyone. Sad things. Tragedy things. Did it help you that tragedies also occur to others? Well, no, but one becomes philosophical. Did you mourn your wife? Well, of course. Did you feel 
guilty because you survived the accident and she didn't? I'd hardly call it surviving. Well, what else would you call it? Your life. Look, I didn't come here to talk about myself or my dead wife. I want to talk to you about my son. Very well. Let's talk about your son. He hardly comes home at all anymore. He used to walk in at 5.30 sharp and we'd have a sherry together. I'd have it all ready for him. But now, uh, he's barely home in time for dinner. Sometimes he doesn't get there for dinner at all. Well, sometimes he dines here with us. You see, he's here because the girl is here. Well, sometimes he comes to see her in the middle of the day. In his lunch hour. And even when he isn't here, they are in constant communication. Constant? He phones her, you mean? Well, I think they communicate telepathically. Well, that's impossible. Well, I only know that when she has a touch of virus, he knows it before our medical doctor does. I know that she purposefully puts him out of her thoughts before going to bed. Why would she do that? Because if she didn't, he wouldn't be able to sleep. You see, she loves him. Doctor, do you believe all this foolishness? I remain open to what I observe. I close no doors. That's really all I can say to you on the subject. I couldn't tell whether or not I had made any impression on David's father. And I never saw him again. But I saw David more and more frequently as he came to visit young Jane. And I was not in the least surprised when he asked to talk to me alone in my office. Dr. Alden, I want you to give me a job. A job? You want me to give you a job? Yes. <laughs> what kind of a job? Uh, any kind. You want a job here? At the sanitarium? Well, I could be an attendant. That takes training. Well, I could be, um... I, I could take care of the ground, plant things. That takes training, too. Oh. Well, I could um, wait on tables, scrub floors, a a anything. Any kind of job. But you already have a job, David. You run a big business. Doctor, I, I don't want to do that anymore. Why do you want to scrub floors here at the sanitarium? I want to be near her all the time. Well, you already communicate. Telepathically, But it's not enough. I, I want to see her, touch her, smell her, see her smile, hear her cry, watch her frown. And just, just everything. Have you told your father what you want to do? Yes. Yes, I, I even told him I wanted to sell the business. Well, what did he say? Well, you're not going to believe this, but he said, okay. Really? Go ahead. It's all right with me. And what does he say about your taking a job here? If that's what you want. That's, that's what he said. I don't know that he liked the idea, but... You see, Doctor, my father has always been a cold earth wanderer. Like me. You know the poem, I traveled through a land of men, a land of men and women too, and heard and saw such dreadful things as cold earth wanderers never knew. I, I said that poem to my father. Uh, Jane had taught it to me, and I think, I think he understood it a little bit. That's very interesting. I don't want to be a cold earth wanderer anymore, Dr. Alden. And you think that coming to stay at a sanitarium full of disturbed people will help? Well, why not? Why shouldn't it? Jane talks to those disturbed people. They talk to her. Well, why can't I learn to do that? Do you want to? Yes, I do. I, I think that whatever is disturbing them must be disturbing me, too. We're all people, aren't we? I, there's not all that big a difference between them and me. Are you sure, David, that you don't want to become a psychiatrist? I never thought of that. Well, think about it. You have time. And meanwhile, if you want to scrub floors and wash dishes here, we'll make room for you. I'll move in tomorrow. And he did. He occupied a tiny room on the third floor. 
And if he descended to Jane's big room, two floors below, they never disturbed anyone. And I saw no reason to interfere. David worked hard at cleaning, washing dishes, and other menial jobs. Jane was in and out of the building as she pleased. At times, she signed herself out for an entire day. I believe, though I never asked, that she went to see her mother. Something in me is thinking, Dr. Alden. Oh? And what is that something thinking, Jane? My mother loves me. I believe she does. She loves me as if I was part of herself. She can't think of me as anything except part of herself. Yes? She's a cold earth wanderer, Dr. Alden. She's afraid of the dreadful things that cold earth wanderers never see or hear. And you're not? I want not to be. Because if you don't see and hear the dreadful things, how will you see and hear the beautiful things? I think you have a point there. And something is thinking inside me about her protecting me. She thinks she's protecting me from these dreadful things, but she isn't. Nobody can do that. And I don't want her to. Because she might protect me from the beautiful things, too. Jane, why do you always say something inside me is thinking? Because that's the way it feels. Now, what do you think that something is that is thinking inside you? I think... I think it is my guardian angel. I see. Tell me, Jane, have you discovered what your real name is? That always used to bother you. As a matter of fact, I'm pretty sure I, I know already what my real name is. I think my real name is going to turn out to be Harmony. That's a lovely name. Yes, isn't it? Harmony. It's at times like these that psychiatry becomes exciting. Stops plodding and takes to the air. Even a tired old therapist like myself feels a burgeoning within and a sense of expectation like like spring itself. Yes? Come in. May I talk to you, Dr. Alden? Of course, Jane. Come in. Uh, David's with me. Then both of you come in. Hello, David. Thank you, Dr. Alden. Do sit down. I'm... I'm signing myself out, Dr. Alden. Oh? You know you're free to do that. You always have been. She means for good, Dr. Alden. Oh. Well, we're, uh, leaving together. Probably we're going to get married. I see. Do you approve? Do you care if I do? No. No. Well, then? Something in me has, has been thinking, Dr. Alden... Your guardian angel? Yes. And something has been thinking inside David, too. I suppose it's his guardian angel. And what have your two guardian angels been thinking? That it is the right time for us to be married to each other. Do you understand? I think I do. And maybe I can make both of you understand even a little more than you already do... If I may. Oh, yes. Please. Through all these months that you've known each other, they've been bewildering. They've been difficult. I know that. But they've been necessary. Because you've both been going through what we who study the emotions call the identity crisis. Oh, I've heard of that. You've both been trying to find out who you are. Who you really are. Not what someone has told you you are or what you should be or shouldn't be, or could be or could not be, or must or mustn't aspire to be, but what you are, truly, fundamentally are. Finding your real name, that was just a way of expressing the desire to know yourself, your guardian angel. It's the same thing. The angel you felt to be always with you, was always with you, and will always be with you. Because your guardian angel is yourself. Your own true and real essential self. 
Now I've said enough. God bless you. And so they went off together. I believe Jane's mother married again. And David's father, I heard, found that he could run his business by himself. And does so very profitably. Oh, David is in medical school. Preparatory to becoming a psychiatrist. A strenuous profession, as I've said before. But an exciting one. And I personally cannot imagine myself in any other. Now, wasn't that a happy little story? With happy endings all around? Well, yes. Except that the ending to a story is never the end of the characters who lived it. They go on. And what happened to David and Jane and to Jane's mother and David's father and to Dr. Alden is that they all eventually died. But not, let us hope, before they had lived. I'll be back shortly. How well, how successfully we live depends on how well equipped we are when we enter the world. How many of us are destined to be cold earth wanderers? How many will find the intrinsic spirit that lives within, that precious, that invaluable guardian angel? God bless. Our cast included Guy Sorrell, Jada Rowland, John Beale, Mary Jane Higby, and Russell Horton. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.